Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. And it's a really great pleasure to introduce my old friend. I mean, not old, my young friend but from a long time ago, Ron Maral from the University of San Carlos in Brazil. And I was a bit worried that he arrived in Trieste and we found very bad weather. But he came prepared with Whitney's on the uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> So Whitney's is on the is going to help us out here. So thank you very much, Tom. Thank you so much for the invitation that my friend from childhood. Uh, and, almost. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, the talk is uh, very elementary and uh, only basic concepts of calculus and geometry, but it leads to some uh, research questions, indeed some research questions. So Whitney uh, is uh, his Whitney teaching after he retired, uh, with his uh, he dedicates to education, and this is his young pupils. And Whitney is uh, associated to many topics in mathematics. You probably heard all this with the topology being one of them. And uh, uh, it was very important uh, um, in the development of topology or geometric analysis. Today we are going to use mainly Whitney umbrella. Also, Whitney seem to have a, 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 an indirect relation to uh, this uh, ICTP because this man, Jim Eels, was his uh, second PhD student and was your maybe first head of the maths uh, section here at ICTP. So let's start with the surfaces. A surface in R3, it's, uh, it can be thought in two different ways. One can use the defining equation of zero of a function from R3 to R, to call it implicit equation, or a parametrization from R2 to R3. And uh, <coughs> we know Sartre's theorem tells us that most implicit equations yield a smooth surface. So here's a bit of a plane embedded in R3. But, however, it's not true for most uh, parametrizations. You have uh, parametrizations of surface can self-intersect intersect along lines like this. Two planes transversely intersecting. And also you can have a presented isolated triple points. And uh, all functions we consider here are polynomials. And apart from that, we are going to assume the markets are semi-regular, in a sense defined by Whitney in his paper on single lives of Martin in 1944. There in this paper he said, if you take a general smooth mapping of a surface M into R3, the singularity may be quite wild. But a slight alteration in of F will reduce them to a single type. The new map is semi-regular, I will define soon. The single type of singular point mapping from M to R3 is called Whitney umbrella, and I will also explain why. Um, <clears throat> the image of a semi-regular map from R2 to R3 is a surface whose local aspects are similar to the following. So you have a piece of plane or intersection, transverse intersection of two planes or a triple point, and also can present similar points that will look like this. In other words, semi-regular mappings are immersions with normal crossing, except 
at a finite number of similar points. Uh, the singularity hypothesis on our map. Sorry, in, on which one is the singular point in the last picture? Because there's that, a whole line of intersection there. Right? That's right. This is called the, 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 the fourth is called the singular point. The others are immersed points, you know. That's the point of this talk, to make a dis distinction between this sort of uh, concept of singularities from the define equation point of view and the parametrization point of view. This is the main point. So the semi-regularity hypothesis on our polynomial map will simplify the exposition. We also assume that the implicit equations are the simplest ones, sometimes called reduced equations. For a more general setting, if you are interested, you can consult this paper I have with Bill Bruce, or even a paper of Bradley Pin, ideas associated with the singularization. So we call a singular surface the image of a semi-regular map. And singular surface is an assemblage of these pieces. So you put together like in a Lego plate. And uh, the self-intersection will join and become a curve of the self-intersection of this singular surface. Let's take an example with two singular points. And I'm uh, going to identify the x part of the boundary of those two. And then I get this surface with a self-intersection uh, segment of self intersection and two singular points. And uh, <clears throat> I have only one curve as a bound. But now, if I flip the top singular bit and rotate around the self intersection and do the identification of the x part, what I get is another similar surface now with two boundary components and the same self-intersection. So the self-intersection curve of the singular surface is the image of a curve in the domain in R2. This first example is the image of a cylinder, while the other example is an image of a middle strip. And you get the, uh, the curve, the sole, the curve that goes on the once around and closes, and identify that, that you have two points, U and V, you identify the points on the left and the right, and then you have a segment. So the, the singular surface is like this, with only one single curve as the boundary. This is called Drucker conoid. So, uh, you see the, there is only one single curve as a boundary, so you could glue a disk, a tube disk. If you do so, what you get is a familiar surface called crosscut. That is the, a semi-regular surface, a singular surface, that represents the, is a model of the projective plate in R3, with two singular points. So, similar surfaces can be models of all the more orientable surfaces in R3, just by taking connected sum of this model. Another model, similar surface with triple point and six uh, similar points. Now I'm going to get three of those curves that go only once around and closes inside a Mebius strip and put them together, intersecting in three points. And now I'm going to do exactly what I did to obtain the Kluger conoid all together. So there will be three Kluger conoid, and this will define a triple point. And uh, to make it uh, simpler to see this uh, identification, I take the uh, plane model of the um, Maybe straight, and those three curves that go 
because only it was round and closed with alpha alpha 1, beta beta 1, and gamma gamma 1, they are opposite uh, uh, singular points. And uh, I'll make another thing is that we will remove some disks to make this clear. Once I do this uh, identification, uh, I do the identification alpha, uh, identifying the points that are on the left and the right. So you have a segment, and you're going to have one uh, broker conoid. Do the same with beta and gamma, and you have three broker conoid, and they are arranged in this way. And now I put back those disks, the blue, green, and red, and also another disk that is the boundary of the original menu strip. And now what you get is another model of the projective plane of a uh, standard Roman surface, with a triple point and six singular points. Oh. Uh, before uh, getting on the surfaces, uh, plane curves will give us some uh, easy uh, concept that will generalize to surfaces. Plane curves also are represented in two ways, as a defining equation of two variables, or a parametrization from R to R2. Oh, another uh, very basic concept from calculus is that a singular point of a function and we say that it's non-degenerate if the second derivative is different from zero. A singular point of a map of a, a function in any variables is when all partial derivatives vanish. That means the vector whose entries are the partial derivatives are all zero, and then you call this gradient effect the function. So there is a, a matrix and by a matrix of the second partial derivatives and this is called the Hessian matrix and uh, a singular point for f from Rn to R is not degenerate if the determinant of the Hessian is different from zero. The functions in any variables whose singular points are all non-degenerate are all Morse functions. An example, in two variables you have those three types of Morse functions and they have the name minimum, saddle and maximum. So the origin is the singular point uh, for the all three uh, examples. For mappings, the concept of singularity is uh, you take a mapping from Rn to Rp and the coordinate functions phi i and consider this p by n matrix whose rows are the gradient of the coordinate function. And we say that the point is singular if the rank of the, this matrix is less than the maximum possible value. In this case, it's less than the minimum between M and P. That's the dimension of the domain and contour domain. The matrix is called the Jacobian matrix. It's in fact uh, is, uh, in honor of uh, Carl Jacobi, who was the supervisor, doctorate supervisor of Otto Hesse, the one the Hessian. And uh, the non singular points of mappings and the uh, functions are called regular points and they are image regular values. Uh, an example take this map from R2 to R3 with the first coordinate function is just the variable x. It's like a, a family of plane curves parametrized by this x variable. In this case, the Jacobian matrix is like this, and a singular point is the point where the partial derivative of P and Q 
vanish. So, uh, there is also a, a curve in R2 called the double point curve that is pairs of points sharing the same image. So take xy and x prime y prime with the same image and then you follow from that that x is equals x prime and you have the other two equalities. But now y and y prime must be different. So I can also put this as divided differences as Newton would call uh, the first and the second equality. Now, if y prime tends to y, you have the, the partial derivative of p and q with respect to y. So, the singular points, they are in the appearance of the double point curve. So, you have this ordinary double point, and the closure of that set is the double point curve containing the singular point as the limit. So it's like this. You have uh, a double point curve <coughs> in the domain and it's sent to a self-intersection curve in R3. And the singular point is the end point of the self-intersection curve. So, from Whitney's paper, that is from Rn to R2n minus 1, we extract this definition. From R2 to R3, we say the mapping is semi-regular if the rank is maximum, 2, or up to change of coordinates, the following two conditions hold. The first is, you take this uh, derivative, must be the node vector, and the second is that these three vectors are linearly independent. In this case, we say that x0, y0 are uh, is a, a point where the mapping is semi-regular. These points uh, verify these conditions are isolated points. There, the rank drops from 2 to 1. And so, semi-regular mappings from R2 to R3, given by those conditions, they are, uh, the Jacobian method, almost always the max, has a maximum rank. And it's also curves that uh, along possible double point curves. And uh, so it's not a singular point, but a self intersection. Also, they are generically one to one branch covering maps from over their image. We can see examples of this. Oh, like immersions with normal crossing, they set a finite number of singular points with properties of similar, similar regular markings. So, uh, the singular points are located in the closure of the double point curve. They are endpoints of the self intersection line. And we provide a parameterization of a neighborhood of this point where the Jacobian matrix has run one. That's the mapping. Locally, as x, y square, x times y. Equivalently, we use capital letters for the variables in R3, z square minus y times x square equals zero. So the mapping is an involution on the y-axis, taking uh, uh, zero y, and 0 minus y to the same point. Here is how it looks, the neighborhood of the uh, origin in R2 is sent to this uh, root surface. The same happens for all semi-regular maps. And uh, a double point curve is defined. The domain is sent to the self intersection curve of the parameterized surface, generically 2 to 1. That means almost always two points on the double point curve have the same image on the self intersection curve of the parameterized surface. There is also the possibility of isolated triple points. 
And those triple points are themselves double points of the double point curve. <coughs> so the three points are themselves ordinary double points. Here's an example. This is a, a suppose this is a curve that is a double point curve of a semi regular map with alpha and beta uh, singular points. And so what you're going to have uh, in the image as uh, identification of the point on the left and the right of alpha and beta. And so we start uh, going around that curve and doing the identification. And what you get is this. You start with uh, phi of alpha, and then you go to the blue part that is uh, uh, identified with the blue part, uh, the other blue part of the double point curve, of this curve, and then go to the green part, and then you arrive at the beta uh, image. So this is a ramified covering map that is 2 to 1, generic 2 to 1, 3 to 1 at the triple points, and 1 to 1 on the singular points. <clears throat> so, the Witten umbrella. So, the zero set of this uh, defining equation contains the image of the uh, parameterization provided by Whitney, x y squared x times y but as well as the negative part of the y-axis. The part of the, this part of the y-axis not covered by the image is uh, the y-negative, right? So this uh, is uh, an extra bit that appears in the defining equation. So is what is called the handle of the of the Whitney umbrella. Huh? Can you see? Huh? That's probably Maybe like this. <laughs> <It's like that. laughs> That's a, uh, an umbrella. That's it. It's <laughs> it wants to keep the water. So. And then uh, that's the name that they give to the So the function defining the umbrella has this gradient. And the gradient vanishes along all the y-axis in R3. On the other hand, the Jacobian matrix of this parametrization, the rank is less than 2 only at the origin. So, from the point of view of implicit equations, all points in the y-axis are singular, while the parametrization is only the origin. That's a the difference. This bit happens always when you take uh, uh, implicit equations, uh, these uh, surfaces. They have, uh, for the implicit uh, for the zero of the functions, there is this continuation. Uh, this is a, a common phenomenon in all these uh, uh, algebraic surfaces with this, uh, we call this whisker. So an extra bit in the R3. So for plane curves, uh, parameterized plane curves, we can also have this concept of semi-regularity, considering that the plane curve presents only a finite number of ordinary double points, transversal crossings, and a finite number of simple cuspidal type points. This is given by the derivative is the zero vector, or and the second derivative different from the zero vector. The Jacobian matrix we know is this, and so the maximum rank is one. Therefore, a point is singular if the derivatives of the, co the coordinate function vanish. So geometrically, you have uh, 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 the vector tall is tangent to the curve and a counterclockwise rotation p over 2 transforms the tangent vector in the plane to this new vector perpendicular to the curve like this and then we call this 
vector, a normal vector, the plane curve. The vanishing of the normal vector characterize the singular points of the map from R to R2. The local aspects of the plane curve parameterized by a semi-regular mapping from R to R2 is like this. Transverse double points, simple cusp points and lines. It's curious that uh, these planes all together put together as a surface of a Witten umbrella. Uh, it's a one parameter family of plane slice of the umbrella. But the umbrella wasn't quite like this because this was the parameterization provided by Whitney. But if you change coordinates in the source R2 and in the target R3, you can put it in this form. And now, taking the x-axis containing the self-intersection, you see that x equals 0, you have the cusp, x negative, you have the double points, and x positive, you have only the simple line. This is also called unfolding of the singular point. There are other names, but uh, this is related to that uh, concept that um, Whitney mentioned in the beginning of the talk, saying a slight uh, perturbation. No, it wasn't perturbation. A slight deformation. deformation. Yeah. I'll, something like that. This concept evolved to this unfolding, we also call versal unfolding, or stable perturbation. They are all new uh, ways to describe what Whitney was mentioning in, in his book. So David Mont was my PhD supervisor in Warwick. He wrote a paper called Looking at Bent Wires. Looking at Bent Wires uh, is a paper where David uh, invites us to make an experiment with a wire, and bending it, curving it with some torsion, and looking at it with one eye, close one eye, and look at it moving in front of you. What you see is exactly this transition. And uh, I will draw here, if you project down to the horizontal plane, you have the intersection. And then there is a, a direction uh, that is t tangent to the curve to give you the uh, cusp. So this is an interesting thing. You see the unfolding of the plane curves. For surfaces now, let's repeat the same for surface, a semi-regular mapping, and the Jacobian matrix is like this. And then you have the maximum rank is two, and the point is singular, where all the two by two minors are all zero. And the vectors, the derivative with respect to x and y, partial derivative of phi, generate a plane tangent to the surface and there is this uh, uh, vector product of these two vectors giving another vector perpendicular to the surface. We call this normal vector. And the components of the normal vector are the two by two minus of the Jacobian matrix of the transpose of the Jacobian matrix so we have this uh, analogous to the plane curves. The vanishing of the normal vector characterized a singular point. The mapping on the graph. Oh, gradients of plane curves. Now we have the defining equation and the implicit equation of the curve parameterized by phi and the gradients like this and uh, if you apply the chain rule to that identity, f composed with phi identical with zero, you have that the dot product of the gradient and the tangent vector to the curve 
is zero. In other words, the gradient is orthogonal to the tangent vector. That means it's parallel to the normal vector. So we can compute there is a function lambda such that the gradient is equal to lambda times the normal vector. This function vanishes at double points and at singular points of the curve. Here is a situation where the normal vectors ignore the self-intersection. They are linearly independent there, but the gradient, now the gradient as it approaches to the self-intersection, it gets smaller and smaller, zero, and then change direction. So, this identity relates the, van the order of the vanishing of the gradient and that of lambda. The function. At normal crossing, the vanishes are of first order, while the singular points, the vanishing is of order two or more. This order of vanishing of the gradient is known as Müller number of the plane curve. So, in the masterpiece Singular Point of Complex Hypersurface, John Müller describes what the golden, we call the Müller number of a polynomial function from C2 to C. It works in the complex case. And uh, one interpretation of the Milner number is the number of non-degenerate critical points that a singular point splits into when the function and the corresponding parametrization is slightly altered. That's the term that uh, Whitney used, is slightly altered. So, there is a question here that uh, this is in the complex case. Uh, how much we can see in the real case? In this question, when is it possible to obtain this number on, on the real, the number of non-degenerate critical points? And uh, we're going to put like that, mu of f and mu r of f, and, and the altered uh, parametrization is called a good real perturbation. That's the name it's given when you see in the reals what you guarantee in the complex case. And uh, the th theorem is that there exists a good perturbation for any parametrization from C to C2. Uh, there is uh, some Mild, mild hypothesis. One is that uh, f, the initial f, is not uh, as a non-constant uh, function, and the uh, singularity is the zero is a singularity, isolated singularity. And uh, this theorem has been proved independently by Norbert Akampo and Lucien Zeiger and in different languages, and they never met. <laughs> and it was nearly the same year. And uh, the technicalities normal Akampo uses is resolution of singularity, it's also called blow-up. And uh, Lucien Zadri uses uh, uh, interpolation polynomials called cherry cherry polynomials. Let's see an example that uh, how they do this, how they deform, they slight alter the, the given uh, function, the markings, and obtain uh, the number of non-degenerate critical points expected. Here is the f and the parameterization. If you calculate this, you get the lambda is t to the 8. So the numeral number is 8. So you have 8 non-critical uh, points, uh, non-degenerate critical points, and what they do, uh, here is the, the, the trace of the image of phi uh, before alteration. Now we are going to alter. And then what they do, they uh, distribute the eight non-degenerate critical points in this diagram where the cross uh, 
is related to uh, represents the saddle point and the point dot is maximum and minimum so it's called the Deakin diagram and now to obtain the, the trace of the altered slightly altered parameterization, you just join the dots, just, not the dots, but the crossings, and you obtain this. It's also called morsification, because all points now is a morse point, because it's maximum minimum sum. So you can do this for all uh, plane curves uh, parameterized like this, with the um, A and B co-prime, you can make the find out what the lambda function that relates the gradient and the normal vector and what you obtain in this case is t to the a minus 1, b minus 1 is the normal number so you can make a big jinking diagram like that a minus 1 uh, distributed like this in the vertical and b minus 1 in the horizontal and now join the crossings and you obtain your morsification of your <coughs> original map. That's the, the how you construct the good real perturbations. Uh, go back to the surface. Now the gradient of the surface. Um, you have this uh, nabla f, and. Uh, <coughs> We denote by J the, the transpose with T, little T on the top, the transpose of the Jacobian matrix. And they have a little theorem that A part is the gradient belongs to the kernel of the transpose of uh, parameterization. And at regular points, the kernel is generated by the normal vector. So the proof uh, of the part A is just a chain rule applied to this uh, identity. So you give derivative with respect to x and derivative with respect to y, and in matrix form you see the gradient belongs to the kernel of the transpose of the Jacobian matrix. For B at regular points, you know that the rank of the Jacobian is 2, therefore at this point the kernel of the transpose as I mentioned, one. So you have to find one non-zero vector that generates it. And you're going to see it like this. Well, take a N1, a 3 and N2, 3 by 3 matrices, obtaining from the Jacob, the transpose of the Jacobian matrix, add an extra line, uh, derivative of V with respect to X, to obtain N1, and derivative of uh, phi with respect to y to obtain m2. Now we calculate the determinant of those two singular matrices. Expanding from the first row, what you obtain is that the normal vectors, that is the 2 by 2 minus of the transpose of the Jacobian matrix, times that uh, the transpose is 0, it means that the normal vector belongs to the kernel. So, since it's not zero, it generates. So, uh, as a corollary, you have that the gradient that's parallel to the normal vector, and uh, that is, that there exists a lambda function now, a lambda polynomial x, y, such that the gradient is equal to lambda times eta. The plane curve lambda equals to zero is the double point curve of the, uh, of the parameterization. So the zero of this polynomial is the double point curve and are sent to the surface intersection to the surface. At this point, the mapping is due to one, almost always, and uh, uh, they have the same, uh, same e, they have the same image of the self-intersection curve, and at similar points they are one to one. Uh, such points are located in the closure of the curve of double points, and the singular points are sent 
mapping at the endpoints of this self-intersection curve, just like we've seen in the uh, with the umbrella example. Let's take an example of map from R2 to R3. This one, <coughs> the, the parameterization and the defining equation of the surface. Let's see that the phi is semi-regular. You just calculate that derivative and obtain those two points. At those two points, those three vectors, conditions for semi-regularity, are linearly independent. And let's find the double point curve. Now the double point curve, you calculate the gradient and you take this, uh, the normal vector and then you see that the lambda, in this case, defining the double point curve, is x squared plus y squared minus 1, is a circle of radius 1 centered at the origin. So, we have this curve and it's set. So you're not going to show us a picture of that? Oh, well, okay. look at that. Okay, uh, thank you. Look at that. Now, if you, if you parameterize by cosine and sine the, the circle, you send by that, uh, by that mark phi to the parable. Huh? X squared plus y equals to 1. This is the image, the, the parable. So at those points, those points are singular points of the surface. And a neighborhood of each of these points is a Wheaton umbrella. So the image of this map looks like this. I mean, if you take the neighborhood containing the double point curve in R2 and send that uh, neighborhood, what you get is this. And there is a bubble there. You can see uh, the self-intersection curve creates a bubble uh, in the image of the parameterization. Let's take an example with a triple point now. With a triple point and again two with the umbrellas. This is the example I'm going to explore. What well, the defining equation uh, is not so simple to find, but with some uh, computer algebra you can have this uh, as a resolution of two polynomials. And then you obtain this as a defining equation. It's semi-regular. If you calculate the derivative, you get those two points. Note that the two points, they have the same uh, first coordinate equal, and the second uh, coordinate, they are symmetric. And at these points, those three are linearly independent. At all other points, they are rank two. So uh, this mapping phi is a, a slightly uh, alteration of this one that I just uh, showed you. It's a, a slightly uh, there is a minus y in the second component and the minus y cubed in the, the third component. This one belongs to a family of mappings classified by David Mond. Uh, we are taking k equals 1. These mappings, they, in, when altered, can present k triple point. So, let's uh, deal with that mapping of the example. We have to find uh, the double point curve. The double point curve uh, we calculate the gradient and the normal vector. And now we have three possibilities, at least one of them makes sense, to obtain the double point curve. And you get this. It's an eighth degree uh, polynomial whose zero is the double point curve of that mapping. And uh, for this mapping, this double point curve, what we have is this. Is that example I already gave to you? And uh, the image by phi is this surface. Well, I must say that uh, when I first studied this, uh, we didn't have uh, 
computers to do this drawing. So I used to make some uh, uh, cardboard models, you know, taking that uh, double point curve, finding its image, like I already did, and then gluing uh, the complement of a neighborhood containing that double point. I managed to make some models or some drawings, but not as nice as you can see here in a more, more modern way. Uh, so that curve, as we've seen, uh, is sent to this one. And then the complement of that curve, if you take a neighborhood containing that double point curve on the left, the complement are cells that you blew on that uh, uh, self-intersection curve to obtain the, the image. So, this guy, Thomas Bunchoff from Brown University, in the eight, uh, this happened uh, in the 1986. Uh, uh, in 89, he was visiting Warwick, and he saw some of the, my drawings, uh, and uh, he asked me if uh, I could give the parameterization to him. Because Sorry, Tom, just a very naive question. So when you say this happened, from a research point of view, the point is just to find a new example of the way these... What is exactly the issue here is to... The issue will come. To, will come. To uh, find an example that has a certain geometry, a certain structure. Precisely. Do you see the good real perturbation for curves? Now, I'm going to ask the question, is there a good real perturbation for mappings? So can you see in the real case what is guaranteed in the complex case? So this example, uh, so Thomas Dunshaw, he had uh, uh, access to computers in 1989 and he produced that image that I couldn't have. Uh, I didn't have access to this. And uh, it was so beautiful that it became the cover image of notes. And this uh, is a rude surface you, with that uh, parameterization I provided to him. So, uh, good real perturbations for, for these mappings. These mappings, uh, are we, we see the curve, in the plane curve case, the plane curve case, all uh, parameterizations from C to C2, they have good real perturbations as proved by Akampo and Rusenzai. So I ask the same question here. Good real perturbation for C2 to C3, but for that I have to interpret the Mueller number in a different way. So there is another interpretation of Mueller number called a topological interpretation. Not only uh, the number of uh, non-degenerate critical points that are point split into, but like this. Mueller, he gets the uh, function from C2 to C, to C with zero an isolated critical point. And then he gets this uh, uh, intersection of an S3 of a very small radius with the pre-image of zero. And this is, S3 is in R4, in C2, right? So this is a knot. And he said that uh, Carl Browner in 1928 he studied those knots. And then using Erisman vibration theorem, he creates this vibration called Mueller vibration, the complement of that knot. And using this projection, and the fiber is something that uh, when you close it, it, he proves it is homotopic, uh, equivalent to a wedge of SC1s. It's a bouquet of SC1s, and the number of SC1s is the Mueller number. This is a topological interpretation of the Mueller number. So it's called a compact surface with that boundary, that knot as a boundary. 
is called the Mueller fiber. So, David Mohn tried to do the same for the mappings. And from C2 to C3, it, the, he defined another invariant called image Mueller number. The image Mueller number uh, is going to be used. Well, first we need a vibration theorem. Because of our objects now are not uh, manifolds but singular surfaces, we use Tom isotopy lemma to obtain a mapping vibration, a vibration of the image now, not the pre-image like the, the numerous case, but the image. And the vibration is an image of a, is a, a singular surface, and David Mond proved it's a homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres S2. And the number of spheres is the uh, image Mueller number. I call this mon fiber. It's a singular surface. And then we asked, when can we see this in the real case? And we proved this. A good perturbation exists if and only if, up to change of coordinates, the mapping are those two examples I presented. And uh, the first one and the second one for k equals 1. So we proved that in the late topology. <laughs> this <laughs> disappeared. Topology vanished. And uh, so it's in a sharp contrast to the case of plane curves when you always have a real, good real perturbation. In the case of uh, surfaces, only when you have this family of mappings. And here is the, the example, is a, a slight uh, alteration of that uh, mapping. Here is a, a, a slight alteration. For any value of t negative, you obtain this. Can you see the bubble there? Yes. And in this case, you have the two bubbles, one that shows here and the other outside, uh, the other side. So here is like alter agent. When I did this, as I said to you, I made the cardboard models. I could see the two bubbles there, so it was homotopic equivalent to a wedge of two spheres in this case. And uh, went back to São Carlos, and a friend of mine, uh, an architect of Gelson or Meda Pinto, he said, let's make it big when he saw the, <laughs> the cardboard model. And he, uh, he uh, organized uh, the, config, config, the, the making of this sculpture uh, that is now in the, the grounds of the library there in São Carlos in my institute, and you see the two spheres, the bubbles there. <laughs> so that was all. Julia. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I was understanding correctly, but at the end, somehow, this uh, minor number resembles some topological environment. Right, Mueller. 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 Yeah. Mueller. But so essentially this Mueller number becomes just like the dimension of the second homology group? Yes, yeah, well, well that's the point. You can put it in, in this way. But as I said uh, there, there is this vibration and then the fibers are uh, a wedge of uh, uh, a bouquet of uh, spheres, one dimensional in that case. In my case, for the two dimension, the surface. But in that case, you have this uh, bouquet. And uh, that's uh, the Milner fiber is a compact surface whose boundary is that knot. And this surface is homotopy equivalent to the wedge of spheres. And the number of the spheres is the Milner number. That's another interpretation. Is a topological interpretation different from the analytical interpretation I gave with the non-degenerate critical points. So when you have 
Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the knot, the yeah. classical knot. If you have a classical knot, there is a, a, a procedure to obtain a surface whose boundary is that knot, is a ciphered surface. The ciphered surface is, is the, what you get uh, like a mono fiber. So, if we get cipher surface and we have concept of genes, yeah. or not. So this uh, does more than number and genus have a relationship with each other? That's right, yeah. It's exactly that. In this case, uh, the genus is, is related to, uh, to half of the neural number in the case of uh, uh, irreducible curves. But uh, can I draw here? Uh, I said to you that I was going, I wasn't going to use, uh, but I don't know if there is a problem with the transmission because he said. Uh, so if you if you have a, a, a knot like that, you orient it, the knot, and uh, you can this procedure gluing what we call the twisted with rectangles. You draw uh, twisted rectangles in each of the intersections here. Is a little rectangle that you're going to put to, to make your, your surface. So here is a, a disc and here is another one outside. And they are connected. So you have two discs that I'm going to shrink to a point and three twisted rectangles. With the three, the twisted rectangles they also are um, deformed to uh, just the segment. So this is uh, a wedge of two. This is, and, and the, the, the curve that gives this is that uh, t square t cubed. In this case, the minimal number is two. Minimal number of associated to p is 2. And the 2 is the number of the spheres in the wedge. So if that's a, a topological interpretation, uh, you have this as the numeral fiber and almost of equivalent to this. And so what happened in the, 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 the surface case, there is this analogy. However, uh, in contrast to the plane curve case, that always you can find the real perturbation in the complex in the surface case only for this family of mathematics. And this is also not invariant. This number is also a not invariant. A not invariant. Yeah, yeah. The, all this uh, the 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 knots that, uh, that Carl Bonner studied, given by this mapping, uh, they are called algebraic knots. Algebraic knots, they, are, they all have uh, these uh, nice properties. You're a torus knot, I think. It's a torus knot, that's right. This is the T to the TA, TB, with A and B co primes, they all a times around like that, and B times around that, it's a torus knot. And then the, the surface here will be A minus 1 times B minus 1 bouquet of S1s. It's a, a homotopy equivalent to that. Okay, well, thank you so much, and we can continue the discussion during the. Sure. International. Oh studio. yes, it's yes. in two minutes. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I leave my email if you want to carry on this conversation, please write to me. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Yeah.